chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be dealing with four books tonight. Four books. Four books in the Bible. Ephesians 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Father, I ask you to bless and anoint the word now as it goes forth. And it will go forth for the purpose that you intended. And it will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. It will be done, Lord, according to what you said. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. A little historical background understanding the writing of the scriptures is very helpful. You know that there are 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. That makes 66 canonical scriptures, canon of scripture. We know that the 27 New Testament books, the canon of scripture, was completed about 90, 95 A.D., somewhere in there. Now, if you're conservative, you believe that. If you're one of these liberals, you know, teaching and preaching Graf Wellhouse and theory and all the rest of that, you may go all the way up to 150 A.D. before the New Testament is finished, but I don't. I believe it was finished by 90, 95 A.D. by the Apostle John, the last book in the, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, was written under the reign of Domitian. Now, there's four books in the New Testament that are, that are different. These are different books. And you say, what makes them different? The time and the place of the writing of these books. They're called prison epistles. They were written by the Apostle Paul while he was locked up in Rome. The last chapter of the book of Acts talks about him being in his own hired house. Now, as far as we know, that was the, uh, that's, that's a reference to the, to, the, to the incarceration in Rome. Now, he wasn't in a prison, but he was in... He was, he was in detention. He couldn't just come about and move freely. He talks about being in bonds in these four books. These are prison epistles. What makes them unique is the doctrine that's covered in these epistles, the attitude that the man had when he wrote them, and the, and the people that he wrote them to. Uh, as you know, the Apostle Paul wrote more books than prison epistles, but these four stand out as that because of where he was and the circumstances surrounding the writing of these books. These four epistles, these prison epistles, are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And you can easily remember them because Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians fall in direct order in Scripture, and then Philemon, uh, written to, uh, to uh, a Philemon about a runaway Jew, a runaway servant whose name was Onesimus. So I thought I, tonight I would uh, talk a little bit about the issues that's involved in these four prison epistles and show you why they're so important. Because uh, when a man is locked up, you know, he's not, uh, he doesn't, uh, it, has, it has a way of affecting his thinking. Now, I want you to think about this tonight. Uh, you know, I don't think that the Apostle Paul would have chosen to be locked up. I mean, how many of you would like to go down to brush him out? Well, brush his clothes now. Morgan County would like to walk up to the gate at Morgan County and say, well, I'm here for the next six years. You know, I mean, who does that? That's utter stupidity. Yet he was locked up. And it wasn't by his own choice, but it was the fact that he chose to stand for the truth and stand for the gospel. While he was there, God used him in some of the most powerful revelations in the Bible while he was locked up. It's not unusual for God to use us in the most extreme of circumstances to crucify the flesh and bring the spirit to life. The Bible said, when I was afflicted, I came back to God. I remembered the Lord. And God does afflict us on occasion. He has a reason to. So I'm going to quickly move through these because we could spend an awful lot of time dealing with them. But I'm trying to lay that foundation for you to understand that these letters that you're reading were written from a man who was locked up. He talks about being in bonds. He mentions it. In uh, Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 20, he uses the term bonds. Ephesians 6.20. He says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. I'm bound, he said. Uh, in the book of uh, Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 7, the apostle says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, Ye all are partakers of my grace, 
these bonds. And look at the book of Colossians, chapter number 4 and verse number 3. Colossians 4, 3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. And then when you come to the book of Philemon, you come, uh, Philemon is a, is a very short book. It only has one chapter. Verse number 10 of Philemon, he said, And I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So each one of these four epistles have a direct reference to the fact that the Apostle Paul was bound. And uh, some say he was bound in chains, may very well have been. And he was bound, and therefore we call them prison epistles. Satan's most lucrative ground where he does his dirtiest work is when you feel like that God may have abandoned you or he's treated you unjustly and you, uh, you're not, uh, you're, you don't see God the way he promised to be there. That's very lucrative ground for Satan. You read about it in the book of Job. You read about it all through the Bible. How when things happen, everybody has a tendency to have a predetermined uh, scenario about how God's going to deal with everything when it happens in your life and how that he's always going to be there. In, uh, you're going to see angels and you're going to hear music and, and things are just going to be so wonderful and the grace of God's just going to bear you up. And sometimes it doesn't happen that way. The grace of God doesn't forsake you and God doesn't forsake you. But sometimes he'll let you feel abandoned. For example, when John the Baptist was locked up, he said, uh, send them and ask him this question. Are you he that should come or should we look for another? And of course, the reason he said that is because he felt abandoned. And others throughout the Bible, Jeremiah said, well, ever since I started preaching in your name, ever, th ever since I started preaching your word, look what a mess I've been in. And he wound up in the bottom of a pit. So that goes through the mind of people. I've had people question time and time and time again, preacher, why are we going through this? I can't give you the why, all I can give you is the who. And the who is all that matters, is the fact that we do know him. In the book of Ephesians, you have the purpose of God. The book of Philippians gives you the attitude to have as you go through it. And then the book of Colossians gives you the person of Christ. These are very important things because they open up stuff to us that helps us understand what God have us know. In Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, he tells you that by grace are you saved through faith. Now he's preaching this while he's locked up in jail. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 10, the apostle Paul says this. Ephesians 6, 10. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. Well, he's preaching to people about putting on the whole armor of God. He's locked up in jail. So I suppose that he put it on too, don't you think? In other words, here I am locked up, and I want you to understand that salvation is by grace through faith. And I want you to understand that your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So put on the whole armor of God. Now that's just two things from the book of Ephesians. When you read the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, you read about God's purpose from eternity past. And you read things that lift and exalt you up to the highest heaven and find out that you've been blessed, with heaven, been blessed in Christ Jesus in heavenly places that can't be taken from you. Has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In the book of Ephesians, as some of the writers say, that uh, things that are only barely mentioned in other passages in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians opens the door and begins to unfold them for you. All of that while he's locked up in jail. We benefit greatly from the fact that the Apostle Paul was locked up in jail. In the book of Philippians chapter number 1, the thing that I get so much comfort from in chapter 1 of Philippians in verse number 12 is this. I would you should understand, brethren, the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. What things? I'm locked up, but it has promoted the gospel. You see, the Spirit of God cannot be bound. You might bind me, Paul said, but you're not going to bind the power of God. So in verse 13, he says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. No doubt some of these people understood how important Paul was. Some of the pagan Romans probably understood that this man right here is different. And he was different. There's no way you could have been around the Apostle Paul and not understood this man is not the run of the mill. This is a different man. He has the anointing of God on him. How many of you have ever been around somebody like that? 
You don't have to promote yourself. The Holy Ghost will take care of that part. And when that unction and that anointing is upon you, there's going to be a power and a presence of God that is undeniable. So the attitude that Paul had while he was in jail is very important. Let me say this to you again tonight. Your attitude is going to determine how you face life and how you deal with your relationship with God. If you get the wrong attitude and get a defeatist, self-pity, selfish attitude, then you are never going to be able to rise up and take hold of a promise and embrace it and say, Lord God, I know this is for me too. It's for others and it's for me too. It's horrible at how Satan can beat you down and make you feel so unworthy for anything that God would do for you. Now in my own flesh, in my own ability, I am completely unworthy. But it's not my ability to make myself worthy that counts. He makes me worthy. It's what God has done in Christ in me that makes all the difference in the world. It's not that I can live a sinless, perfect life and because of that I feel qualified to minister the Word of God. That's self-righteousness and that's pride. And the Bible said, God resisteth the proud. Have you ever wondered why that some people, is, they put so much time and so much effort into preparing for the ministry and yet they can't minister? Have you ever wondered why so many people just seem like they just can't communicate? Maybe it's because even though they're good people and even though they're saved, they're full of themselves. We need to empty ourselves of ourselves and fill ourselves with the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul could have argued and said, hold on a minute. I'm an apostle. What am I doing locked up here in jail? No. He said, I can see the hand of God in my life and that what has happened to me has promoted the gospel. And if his attitude and his motive was right, and it was, what mattered was not Paul. What mattered was the gospel. You see what I'm saying? He said, it has fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, I don't count. I don't matter. What matters is that the word of God goes out. That's the right attitude. You have that kind of attitude, God will be able to draw you closer to him. That pride is a horrible thing. Notice in the book of Colossians, we come down to something now as we begin to dig in deeper because Colossians will take you deep in a heartbeat. In Colossians chapter number nine, chapter number one and verse number nine, the apostle says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now he's praying that someone would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. So apparently he's happy with the will of God in his case. You see what I mean? I am where God wants me to be. I am doing what God wants me to do. I don't know of any greater security you'll ever have in your life is to make your election and calling sure. Is to know that you are where God wants you to be. And if you are where God wants you to be, you're in a place of blessing. You're in a place of blessing. And there's nothing greater than that. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And don't miss your opportunity. When God brought them to Kadesh Barnea, it didn't take him long to get there. And he brought them to Kadesh Barnea, and they sent out spies into the land, came back, and everything God promised them was true. They said it was true. They had this huge cluster of grapes. But what happened? They gave an evil report, the Bible said. That's where the Bible says evil. And I haven't read that scripture in a little while, but doesn't it say evil? Now, when the Bible uses the term evil, it doesn't just throw it around. Because what they did was call bad what God called good. It's back again to that place where you don't differentiate between the profane and the holy. God said, you can take the land. It's your land. Go in there. And yet they came back with an evil report. What happened? Well, they didn't take the land. It was Hebron. That's where David was anointed the king of Israel first time. It was in Hebron. Didn't take the land. What happened to them? For the next 40 years, they had a constant, constant receiving friends in graveyards. <laughs> For the next 40 years, that generation died in the wilderness. And only two men, two men out of the whole bunch, two men made it into the promised land. Who's that? Joshua and Caleb. And Moses didn't make it. What happened to Moses? Somebody know? They took him up to a place called the King's Highway. Do you remember that? That's what it's called. God took him up there and he, what happened? Well, I'm talking about when he took him at the end of his life. Yeah, when God took Moses up there, he took him to the top of 
What was that mountain? Nebo. And he shook and he looked to the north and he looked to the south. He looked to the breadth and the depth and the whole length of the land. And Moses' breath was taken away and God said, that's the land, Moses. That's where your people are headed. This is what I brought you out of Egypt for. This is the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you can't go in. And so God took him and buried him, the Bible says, there at the top of Nebo. And there he, uh, he, he was unable to go in. But Joshua and Caleb made it in. Joshua and Caleb, of all the people that came out of Egypt, the only two that made it in the promised land. You see, they knew their visitation. They knew that moment of spiritual discernment and decision making. They knew that a moment of crisis had come. Joshua and Caleb knew that they had better choose God and his promise at that moment. And they did. And because they chose that instead, have you ever noticed? You ever noticed in the Bible? Have you ever noticed that the crowd 99.9% .9 of the time is wrong? <laughs> They're wrong. Only a handful stood up and embraced the promise of God and went into the land. What's that say, preacher? Don't listen to the crowd. For the most part, they're wrong. So you, you know the knowledge of his will. I need to move along. Look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, all thing, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and if in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And on we could continue to read. It's, it's mind-boggling to think that a man is writing like this and he's locked up in jail. He's not sitting in the library. He doesn't have this great, vast uh, repository of books He's sitting in jail, and yet all of this knowledge and wisdom is flowing through him, and he's writing it down in Scripture. You know why, of course? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. No prophecy of the Scriptures, any private interpretation. They spoke not by their own will. They spoke as the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they wrote out the Word of God. Now, you mentioned something here tonight I think is a great blessing to me every time I get into it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse number four, uh, 49, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 15. Remember the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 45, uh, 49. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now let's let the Bible define what it's talking about by image. Now, the Bible says that you were made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Let's read this scripture with it. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, when Adam sinned against God, he lost that pristine image. Pristine means original, untainted, unadulterated, pure and clean. That's what pristine means. And he lost that image, though he still bore a resemblance and a likeness to God. But you remember in the book of Genesis when Adam bore his son after Abel was killed, who did he bear? Seth. And the Bible says Seth, he bore a son in his own likeness, in his own image. So the reason I say that is because from that man, first man, all the way up to Christ, we all bore that tainted image. When the Lord Jesus showed up, he was the express image of God, the pure, unadulterated, pure image of a holy God. In the book of Hebrews chapter number one and verse number three, the scripture says that he was the express image of his very person. Now here's what that means in Hebrews 1, 3. He was the image of the very essence of the invisible God. Let that settle in. <laughs> Meditate on that for a moment. In plainer words, the Lord Jesus Christ is the image of one that has never been seen. Because the more I study the Bible, the more I firmly believe nothing has ever laid eyes on the pure essence of Almighty God. 
He has only made himself manifested even to his creatures, even to his angels, cherubim and seraphim. So the image of the very essence of the invisible God. The last mention of image as it relates to Christ, guess where you find it? This is very interesting. The last mention, not the last mention of the word image, but it's the last mention of image as it relates to Christ. Do you know the place you find it? Hebrews 1. In plainer words, here's what that means. It means that God's final statement about the image of Christ and the image of Christ as it relates to God is in Hebrews chapter number 1. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us the image that has been restored to man that we lost in the garden through himself. Go back to Colossians. Let's look at this. Colossians 1.15. This was written while he was in jail. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 15. Look carefully. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father. Now here's what I want to emphasize with you tonight. He, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness, get this fullness, dwell. Chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness. Stop. Now, if I were a Gnostic, I could come along and say, sure, the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago was the Christ of God. He had the Holy Spirit, however they define it, come upon him. And he did wonderful things while he was here, performed miracles. And he was even a direct connection with God himself or with that great spirit. Now, a Gnostic could tell you that. But here's something in here that the Gnostic does not like. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the kicker. This is so important for you to understand this. So very important. That the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of the Son of God, was the body of God. It was the body of God. Therefore, he is the express image of the Father. They even use the Greek word pleroma, the Apostle Paul does. And pleroma simply means this. Now, be used in different ways in the New Testament. But here it's used like this for you to understand. That every bit of the essence of every part and every being of all that his body was, everything about his body in complete fullness with no admixture of anything else was the body of God. That's what it means. So now when you come along and you say, as the Apostle Paul did, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, then you've made one of the most profound statements in the whole Bible about the deity of Christ. Remember that, Colossians 2.9. When somebody comes along and says, oh, he was a good man. He was a great teacher. Oh, what a wonderful sage. Oh, he started a good religion. He showed us the way. Oh, my, what a wonderful man. Blah, 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 blah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He was all of that and far more. <laughs> Who is he? He's God. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the spirit. Did I mess it up? I'm glad you caught me. What does it say? In the flesh. He was manifest in what? Flesh. His flesh was unlike any flesh of any human being that has ever lived or ever will live. His flesh was the very flesh of God. I can't get that across enough tonight because this is what the Apostle Paul is saying to you. He is saying 
Now, using the word pleroma, that, okay, you Gnostics out there, sure, you say Jesus is a great teacher. Sure, you say, you say the Christ, the Docetists taught this in the first century. They went out and they started teaching people, oh, the Christ spirit came upon Jesus. Oh, he was wonderful. But the Christ spirit left him too. And when they say Christ spirit, don't let me be fooled by it. They're not talking about the same thing we're talking about. You got to watch wording very carefully. You got to watch it. Watch this too. This is a red flag, big red flag. I don't care who you're reading after. If he's, if he's the president of a Bible college somewhere, if he's a theologian somewhere over here 200, 150 years ago, if all you get out of him is the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, that man doesn't have a clue who he is. He takes his identity away and gives him a, he gives him a, uh, he gives him a kind of an abstract idea. The Christ. What are you talking about? The Christ. Are you talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who had the anointing of the Holy Ghost that came on him at his birth? He was born of the Holy Ghost. Then when he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit came on him in power. And the Bible says when he left at that Jordan River, he went into the wilderness. And the Bible said he went forth in the spirit of power being anointed of the Holy Spirit. There's the difference. And the Holy Ghost never left him. Never left him. And so this idea that he was the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, a bunch of junk. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the fullest sense of the word, the strongest way I can possibly say it, in every aspect, in every perspective, in every way you can look at it, in every way you can say it or think of it, is God. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen. 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 And so the apostle finishes up. Now I'm going to close with Philemon. Philemon's a beautiful little book. It's a beautiful little book. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it's a story, of, it's a human story. Okay? It's a human story. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, it's a story about a slave. Now, let me say this about slavery. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Nowhere in the Word of God does the Bible uh, condone slavery in the sense that you understand it today. The slavery that, was, that started when they, they built this country, hauling all these people over here in slave ship. Keep in mind, keep in mind, right now they are buying and selling human flesh all over this world. Everywhere. Right now. But this man, this message, this story here in Philemon is about the time 2,000 years ago. It records accurately what was happening. Onesimus had run away from his owner, who was Philemon. Guess where he ran to? He ran to Rome. He ran to Paul. He wound up with Paul. So how do you know that? Because of what Paul says in here. Because of what he says about Onesimus. The name Onesimus means beneficial, fruitful, useful, productive. Yet the Apostle Paul said to Philemon, he has been anything but useful and productive <laughs> to you. Until, he said, I got a hold of him. Because the Apostle Paul said this about him. Uh, he said, <coughs> In verse number 10, he said, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have, what? Begotten in my bonds. While I'm locked up here in jail, he said, I led him to the Lord. <laughs> I led him to the Lord. So he left you as a runaway slave, and he came to me, apparently through some kind of a, 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 a communication line, he wanted to get to Paul for whatever reason, who knows. But he got there, and what would Paul do with him? Well, he'd tell him about the Lord. That's what he'd do with him. And he got saved. He got saved. Now look what Paul says, verse 11. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. He even goes so uh, as far as to say, watch this carefully now. He said, whom I have sent again that thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. My heart goes with him. In other words, I trust him. I trust him. His, his conversion is genuine. 
whom I have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered to me in the bonds of the gospel. He was here ministering where you couldn't come. But without thy mind would I do nothing. So in other words, I want to talk to you about this. I hope I get your agreement from you, that thy benefits should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Now, not now as a servant, see this, not now as a slave, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see, you cannot enslave a free man. <laughs> oh, you might put chains on him, but you can't enslave a free man. He's free. If the Son make you free, you're free indeed. If thou therefore count me uh, a, a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or ought thee, oweth thee aught, put that on my account. Boy, isn't that, that sounds like the, uh, who was it over there that found the man beaten and broken on the side of the road? You remember that one? Going down to Jericho? Sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? The good Samaritan? He said, if you've wronged thee, if he, if, if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put it on my account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Uh-oh. You know what he just said? He said, you're saved because I came to you too, Philemon. That's what he just said to him. Because now you've been led to the Lord and your slave has been led to the Lord. That ought to change your attitude. And truly it does, folks. I don't care who a man is, I don't care where he's from, I don't care what his background is, if that man or that woman is your brother or your sister in the Lord, they have a relationship as a brother and sister to the Lord that comes before anything. That is primary, our brothers and our sisters in the Lord. And so he told him, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee and the Lord, refresh my bowels, having confidence in thy obedience I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt do it. The unprofitable had become the profitable. That's a play on words. Say, why? Well, when was he named Onesimus? See, when was he named that? Undoubtedly at his birth. But he never amounted to a hill of beans until he met the Lord. Is there anybody in this house tonight that that speaks to? <laughs> uh, wasted everything you ever touched, failed at ever, everything you ever tried, uh, was a complete washout, wipeout, you know, good for nothing until you met the Lord. And then, the, and then when you met him, your whole life changed. Onesimus. I'd love to have Onesimus in my house. Amen. But think about the man who started all of this. Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, a murdering devil who met Christ on the road to Damascus and God changed him. That's the way the Holy Ghost works. That's what this is all about. It's about him changing us from what we used to be in, by the grace of God into a child of God. Amen. Prison epistles. Father, in thy holy name, I pray you'd bless your word now. We thank you for the blessed word, Father. For scripture, we pray in Jesus' holy name. For Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. God.